be seated, Pastor. Please open your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Before we get into our message this morning, and even before we read our text this morning, I'd like to spend a little bit of time in review, and sometimes reviews are scary. There's, reviews are scarier for teachers than they are for the people that are being taught, for the reason that you really kind of realize what a terrible teacher you are sometimes when you think that you've communicated and you haven't. But uh, could you tell me, first question, could you tell me this morning what the difference between John and the other three Gospels is, what would be the major difference between John's Gospel and Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels? Yes, Joel. Uh, John actually tells you how to be saved. Okay. And the other is more, I think. Yes, okay. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell you the Gospel. The Gospel is who Jesus is. This is who Jesus is. John tells you how to receive Jesus. And so what would be the purpose statement? Do you know where it's at in John? that uh, explains that or makes that really clear, clarifies it? Chapter Yeah, chapter 20 and verse 31. Somebody want to read that real quick? Can you read it for us really, really quickly? Is it 31? Yeah. For these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So why did John write the miracles that Jesus did? So that you can believe that Jesus is God. And so that believing, you can have life through his name. It's important for us because a lot of bad theology comes from bad application of the gospel. For instance, one of the uh, America's most well-known teachers today is John MacArthur. And John MacArthur teaches the gospel according to Jesus from Matthew. And what he teaches is discipleship salvation. That is, when Jesus gives his disciples their marching orders or explains to them what it means to be a disciple, Matthew says, this is how you get saved. I'm sorry, MacArthur says, this is how you get saved. And you have to do all the things that a disciple is supposed to do in order to be saved. But that isn't what Jesus taught. We're actually going to see that clarified in today's text or context. So it's important to know the way or the reason for a thing being written. Uh, discipleship is part of the gospel, isn't it? And the gospel is, what is the gospel? What? Who said I heard it? Jesus died, was buried, and rose Okay, that is that is the synopsis of the, the gospel for salvation. But what's even, uh, even greater simplification for what the gospel is? What? Okay, gospel is good news, and the good news of who Jesus is. So the gospel is Jesus. Is anything that Jesus was or taught not part of the gospel. No, but what is everything that Jesus taught how to be saved? Right, so there's a difference between Jesus saying this is how to be born again and Jesus saying this is who I am and how to follow me. Do you understand the distinction between the two? And so to, to take everything Jesus taught and say, well, you know, not every man that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Or, uh, you know, all the different truths that Jesus taught the Pharisees. Uh, and the truths that Jesus taught um, uh, the, the Sadducees and the scribes and that he taught his disciples, are they how to be saved? And the answer to that is no. When Jesus explains how to be saved, then he's explaining salvation. So do you understand the distinction between the gospel, which is everything that Jesus is and was, and salvation, that is receiving Jesus, who he is? By the way, you don't receive Jesus for anything that he isn't, Right? In other words, when I receive Jesus as my Savior, I agree with the whole package. Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus, everything the Bible teaches about Jesus, do, do I know everything about Jesus when I get saved? No. But do I receive everything Jesus is when I get saved? Yeah. The answer is yes. I will learn things in the future that I don't know yet or that I used to know and I've forgotten. That happens more frequently all the time. I will learn things, but I believe them already. Because I believe in Jesus. Does that make sense? So as a believer, you know, sometimes I think that we want to, you know, you know what the Bible talks about, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Sometimes we want to examine other people 
whether they be in the faith, we kind of give them the tip. Do you know this about God? Do you know this about Jesus? Have you done this? Have you done that? Well, it might be they don't know that. It doesn't mean they don't know Jesus. I mean, they just don't know everything there is to know. But they do. the question is, do you believe everything about Jesus? The answer is, sure I do. I mean, when you're saved, you're brand new, you're just like anything, anything, just, just, just bring it. You know, I'm ready to believe it all. You know, everything about Jesus. And that's the right attitude as a believer. And uh, we have to, of course, use discernment. We have to be wise about believing everything people teach. But you show me from the Bible anything about Jesus, and friend, I agree with it. And so the gospel is who Jesus is. Being saved is how to receive Jesus as your Savior. So that's the difference. So that would be the difference between John's purpose statement in his gospel and the way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke would have presented Jesus. They'd be telling us this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the King of the Jews. Jesus is a suffering servant. Jesus is the Son of Man. So they'd be teaching that about Jesus. And John said, yeah, Jesus is all those things, but this is how you get saved. And so, practically speaking, now that we're at this point, now we've covered this enough, enough weeks and enough times, if you're going to show someone how to be saved, where ought you to go in your Bible? John 3. John, specifically John Three. Last several weeks we've been looking at John the Baptist, and boy, we learned some great things about being able to decrease from the ministry of John the Baptist. And we also learned some encouraging things. Last week uh, in Miami Beach, we preached a message we preached two weeks ago here, and uh, that was uh, not only that uh, you're, you are uh, able to, or that you, John the Baptist is great because he had the ability to decrease, but we also saw that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. You know, it's pretty nice to know that as great a man as John the Baptist was on earth, that my future is better than that. Isn't that incredible? And so we've been greatly encouraged thus far. Let's get in our context this morning. And today we're going to talk about how to be saved. And if from the pastor's heart uh, I could accomplish what I desire to this morning from preaching the Word of God, my heart would be that you would have in your mind a very, very simple, concise, precise easy to present understanding of the gospel so that not only could you just understand that that it's easy for you to know that you're saved because when you understand the gospel and from a simple perspective it ought to just really help you with your assurance to say well yes it's that simple and yes i received it that simply and i'm saved but more importantly i ought to make it so that you could more clearly present it to people uh and here, here's just an exercise for you this is extra but uh, two things. One, I always encourage you as we're preaching through the Word, I always encourage you to read ahead, read along, or read over, make it, make it a personal Bible study. And sometimes you'll read across a text or context, and you'll think, man, I hope Pastor preaches that. He might not. But you could say, Pastor, I hope you preach this when you go through. And he might, uh, it might be rewarding and enriching in that way as well. And uh, then another exercise that I would recommend you in particular as our study in John would be that you'd learn to present the gospel in two minutes. I'm not saying that that's how the gospel ought to be presented every time, but sometimes if you wanted to just to give somebody a simple presentation of the gospel, what Patty just did, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again, and then just expand on it a little bit in less than two minutes. And just so that you could simply present the gospel. Before we read our text again, one last thing. You ever read a gospel tract and realized, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saved according to that tract, and the concluding, the prayer it says to pray? Every time I read a gospel tract, it's like it says to do different things in order to be saved. Now, I'm not bashing gospel tracts. I use them, and I'm happy for all of them. And, uh, but the reality of it is it isn't the words or is it the way that you pray. It's putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that's what saves you. But... I think that sometimes we have a lot to wade through when it comes to how man can overcomplicate something that Jesus made very simple. And so, the last question, who knows and understands how to receive the gospel or receive Jesus better than anyone else? Who knows the gospel the best? Jesus. Jesus does. And so here we are in a place where Jesus is explaining how to be born again or how to be saved. And I just think that you couldn't do a better job of presenting the gospel than Jesus did. And so this is where I go to preach the gospel, and I recommend that you do as well. So here we are, chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to read about this guy, Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest 
except God be with him. That was John's express stated purpose in writing the gospel, wasn't it? To show by the miracles that Jesus was God, and evidently Jesus proved he was God by the miracles that he did. So good uh, supporting material here from an outsider. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that will be where we'll end our text reading this morning and pray. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to know for certain that we're going to see God's kingdom. And that you would just give us a clarity and thrill our hearts with the simplicity of the gospel message. God, I pray if there's any person here today that wrestles with terms that today, just looking at the terms that Jesus used, we would understand those terms within their context and be helped by it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the conversation, the dialogue, and we'll work our way through it this morning, the dialogue begins by Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. I've commented on this so many times it almost seems uh, superfluous to uh, comment on it, but I think it's important because I've heard messages about why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And uh, the fact is, the Bible doesn't say why he came by night. I just think it made sense that a person who was healing thousands of people and had multitudes thronging him on a constant basis probably need to come in the evening to get one-on-one -on -one time. That's just my guess. just makes sense to me that if you're going to see Jesus, probably noon wasn't a good time. Uh, you, weren't, you couldn't get close enough to him when he's doing the miracles that he's doing to actually talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. That's my opinion. And you can... Uh, well, we'll just write a book and reinforce it, cite me, and then I'll, it'll have more validity than it does right now. But if you don't like my opinion, you can toss it as well. I, I, I'm not really concerned about it. But the reality of it is that we know the fact that's important from our context is that Nicodemus came to Jesus. And his stated purpose in coming to Jesus was that he knows that Jesus is God. Implied in the statement that he's not only a teacher, but that he's a teacher come from God, uh, is acknowledges that you do things that only God can do. And it's always important for us to pause whenever we are impressed by what man is impressed with to realize God isn't impressed with the same. In other words, the miracles Jesus did weren't what he came for. He did his miracles to prove he was God so that he could do what he came for, which is to die. If Jesus had come, never performed a miracle, and then subsequently died, then people wouldn't have known he was God. So they only did miracles to impress people that are impressed by miracles. Don't ever forget that God's not impressed by the supernatural. Don't ever forget that. So you know, sometimes Christians think the greatest thing in the world is when God does something supernaturally. And from our perspective, that is indeed the truth. But when it comes to impressing God, and that ought to be what our major concern is, remember, God's never impressed by the supernatural. Supernatural is very natural for Him. And the things that impress God... Uh, oftentimes aren't very impressive to us. God's impressed by faith. God's impressed by obedience. And while faith may not impress you, oftentimes when you express or you uh, when you uh, put faith in God, then you see impressive things from our perspective. But you know, the, God's response to your faith doesn't impress Him. He's God. He's always done the miraculous. But it, it impresses us. But what does impress God is our faith. And so you ought to be thinking in those terms. When you have an opportunity to believe God, to take Him at His word, and to obey His word, my friend, you have an opportunity to move the heart of God, to be pleased. Don't get that out of whack. There are entire denominations built around the, quote, impressive. This last week I had people say, could you please, Pastor, read Acts chapter 2? And see about this matter of speaking in tongues because it's just the most amazing. You'll unlock spiritual wonders in your life if you can speak in tongues. You know, God would be impressed if I spoke in tongues. It's not going to unlock spiritual wonders in my life if I speak in tongues. What God wants me to do is preach the gospel. And if He wants me to preach in a different tongue and He wants to equip me to do that, uh, then that will be fine. But it won't be the language I preach it in. It will be my obedience that pleases God. And impresses him. Yet they get, understand, know God, know his heart. So Nicodemus acknowledged, you came from God. And Jesus' response seems rather terse or rather curt, uh, even in our ways rather impolite. And again, I want to remind you, first of all, that the vernacular of the day would be a little different than what we would use. For instance, you remember the first miracle Jesus did? What was that? Water, Water into wine. What did he say to his mom when she told them to come and see him? What? 
Woman, my time is not yet. What have I to do with thee? <laughs> you know, like uh, the word "gone," which is is a very respectful term in the original language. But Jesus was not being disrespectful, like "woman, what do you want?" Uh, to his mother, it wasn't anything like that. It was just the way that the term was preached. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know, he comes and pays what he thinks to Jesus is a big compliment. You know, you're just you're you're supernatural, man. You're just like you came from God. Well, Jesus did come from God. It didn't impress him that somebody recognized the truth, you see. And so he got right to the point. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, I know you're from God. Jesus said, Well, you're never going to get to God unless you get born again, Nicodemus. You say that seems rather impolite, Pastor. Well, Jesus was pretty busy. And Nicodemus came to him for the express purpose of finding out how to make sure that he was part of the kingdom of God. Implied in Nicodemus' statement that the miracles you do prove that, that God is with you, you see, is an admission that Nicodemus himself is nothing of the sort. He's called, in context, two things that are complementary in his day. He's called a Pharisee, and that's not a bad word for Nicodemus. That simply means that he was an individual who believed in the word of God or the law, and he was conscientious about keeping the law, and being a ruler of the Jews meant that he was a good enough Pharisee that he was respected among his peers. It means that he was conscientious enough about what he knew about God's law and about what he knew about God that he had been put in a position of leadership and was respected among his peers. And so the scripture actually compliments Nicodemus in his position. After the death of Jesus, during the preparations for the burial, we come into contact again with Nicodemus as he is the one who is making the request for the Lord's body. And we also see Nicodemus sitting on a council where they have sent to take Jesus, and the guys that went to take Jesus uh, were afraid to and didn't do it. They saw the miracles he was doing. They came back empty-handed, and they were scolded for it. And Nicodemus is the one that asked the question, does our law judge a man before it hears him? Do we judge someone guilty before we've proven them to be guilty. And so we see Nicodemus is a man of some stature among his peers, isn't he? He is in important places when we see him other, in other instances in the New Testament. And so it's a compliment what the scripture says. This man Nicodemus is not just a, you know, somebody that isn't known. He is a well-known Pharisee who is a leader among the Jews. And he did not come to Jesus by night, I do not believe, because he wished to be under a cloak or veil of secrecy. He came because he had an important question, and Jesus' response to Nicodemus' question was very, very curt, very, very direct, and very, very much what Nicodemus hoped he would address. You ever shared the gospel with somebody, and, you know, and, and they almost said to you, just tell me what you're saying. Tell me what you want to tell me. And then you simply gave them the gospel, and they received it, and they're like, wow, but, you know, we went on and on and on, but never got to the point. Tell me the point, man. Get to the point. And that's what Jesus did. He got right to the crux of the matter. Uh, we had a neighbor in, in our, when we first started our church, we lived in a motor home for a year, and then we bought a condo in a 55 and older uh, community. It's always wonderful to be in a condo community, and it's even more interesting when it's a 55 and older condo community. And so we had interesting neighbors who became very, very close friends of ours. We had a particular neighbor who's with the Lord today. She lived down the hallway from us, and she was, uh, to put it politely, she was the neighborhood gossip. She liked to find out what somebody thought about something so she could go to someone who would think differently and tell them what they thought and then find out what they thought and go back and tell this person and tell everybody what's going on. And so whenever I would see her coming, I know she's going to try to get me to say something that she can uh, tell someone else I said. And so I was always pretty guarded. I uh, tried not to tell her anything, just listen to what she'd say. But she could go on and on and on and on. She liked condo gossip. And I'll be honest with you, condo gossip's fun maybe for the first five minutes. But after a few years, it just gets old. And so I'd see her coming. I'd think, oh, boy, I'm never going to get out of this conversation. If I wanted to get out of a conversation with her, I would direct it to the gospel and try to find out if she was saved. And she'd be like, i got to go bake a cake or something. She's gone. <laughs> Always was that way. Dear lady, good neighbor, but whenever you approach the gospel, she wouldn't hear it. Well, long story short, she, she had recurring cancer, and my wife ended up kind of taking care of her during some of the time and driving her to the hospital and so forth. And even after we'd moved away, uh, she, my wife was still the one who would go follow up with her and take her to 
to the doctor, and Melissa said, you know, I'm really burdened with the situation she's in, that she get saved. So she went to her house one day. Every time you try to talk the gospel, subject got changed, the conversation's over, that sort of thing. Melissa was about to leave, and she said, you know something, I've got to talk to her about the gospel one more time. And she said, you know, uh, Lauren, I just want to talk to you about making sure that you know you're saved. And Lauren said, I was hoping you'd talk to me about that. Gave her the gospel, she got saved, and from there she immediately started getting in the Word of God and being discipled and growing. And, and today she's with the Lord, she's in heaven. Uh, but when someone wants to hear the gospel, they want to just hear it, don't they? And so don't think about Jesus in his response to Nicodemus, that Jesus is just like, well, hey, I'm not interested in talking to you about anything, but how to be saved. <clears throat> Nicodemus came because that's what he wanted to know. He knew that though in his day he would have been an esteemed law and God expert, that he didn't know anything that Jesus knew because he had no clue how to know for sure that he would be part of God's kingdom, or that is that he had eternal life. And Jesus got right to it. He said, except you get, Nicodemus, you've got to get born again. You need to get a birth that you haven't had, and if you don't, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? So if we're going to share the gospel with someone, the first thing we tell them is you've got to get born again. Now, I know today that it's popular for people to say, you know, religious vernacular is confusing to people, and, you know, we've got to find a different way of saying it than the Bible said it, using terms like saved and born again and eternal life and these sort of terms, you know, they're a little bit uh, highfalutin or they're a little over people's heads and they just don't work. Can I say to you that Jesus deliberately on purpose used a term that wouldn't make sense to Nicodemus so that it would make him think? You ever talk to somebody religious and it's almost as though you're talking on the same wavelengths but you just mean completely different things? If you ever have some time to waste and you have internet, Go on YouTube and listen to a Mormon preacher. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how much it sounds and looks like a Baptist church service. You'd be there nodding and going, Amen. Hey, yeah, right. But what they're saying and what they mean and what you think that they mean are two entirely different things. So sometimes terms that are not commonly used or that could mean something ridiculous get people's attention. And Jesus told Nicodemus something ridiculous. He said, get born again. Now, that means more to you ladies than it does to men. But Nicodemus' response of how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Is a very, very good question that brings up the answer. And Nicodemus said, I'm a little bit large and my mom wouldn't like it. I mean, it's his answer. How, can, how do you do that? I'm not sure that that's healthy. I'm not sure I can do that. So he's told to do something that cannot possibly be done so that Nicodemus would understand, first of all, that being born again is humanly impossible. And so Jesus isn't talking about something human. He's talking about something spiritual. And so he draws the contrast between born, water birth and spiritual birth. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, verily, verily. When you see verily, verily in the Bible, that's an unalterable truth. That is, when God is saying verily, verily, He's saying this is always true. This will never be untrue. So verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Well, there are two births contrasted here. There's the birth, which is of water. We probably are all aware that an unborn baby is, in, what do they call it, ambiotic fluid. And when the water breaks, the baby's going to be born. He's born of water. And that's pretty simple, isn't it, for us all to understand. And so there's water birth. That's the physical birth. But then Jesus said there's the spiritual birth. So a man has to be born of water, and then a man has to be born of the spirit. Jesus said, remember to his disciples, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence, or days hence. In other words, the spiritual birth being uh, born out of water is a different matter altogether. Now, I will contrast for you that the first birth is a physical birth, and you have no choice about it. The second birth is a spiritual birth, and it is absolutely your choice and no one else's. Every baby protests birth. And then, and then doctors smack them. That's what I've been told. Okay, so spirit, physical birth for a baby is a traumatic decision that usually, normally, uh, he didn't want to. You know, they're lazy babies. That's why they, have, they induce labor a lot of times. 
because the baby's like, well, you know, things are working out pretty good in here. I'm just going to stay as things are. And then they force that baby out of there, and he comes out. And uh, if he doesn't scream and kick, then they whack him, and he kicks and screams, or so I'm told. Okay, physical birth is a violent thing that the baby has no choice about. Spiritual birth, my friend, is something that every individual who's born spiritually says, I want to be born spiritually. I make the choice to be born spiritually. And what a sweet thing it is to be born spiritually by choice. No one is ever forced into spiritual birth. No one is ever forced into heaven. No one responds because he has no choice to be born again. Every person who gets saved says that's a decision or determination I want to make. Now you say, Pastor, I've seen people that are under violent conviction. I've seen people that are uh, resisting. Well, that's up until the point that they make the choice. But when they make the choice, there's peace, isn't there? Yeah. When they make the choice and, and the, they're born spiritually, it's the sweetest thing you've ever seen. It's a wonderful thing. Spiritual birth is. But physical birth is, a, is not by choice. Spiritual birth is by choice. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus explains that to Nicodemus. Then Jesus said, Don't be amazed. Marvel not that I said unto you that ye must be born again. All right, Nicodemus, I see your jaw about to hit the ground, and you're just your mind's blown right now. Chill out, man. Calm down. Marvel not. And he said, here's an illustration. He uses the illustration of the wind. Hopefully the air conditioner is blowing right now. You've all seen me do this before, but... I think the air conditioner is blowing here, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, if I can just get a page to do what I want it to do. Okay. <coughs> See what that page is doing there? Now, it could be because of my geriatric shaky hands uh, causing it to move a little bit. But you see the movement in this piece of paper? What's moving the paper? The wind is. Can you see the wind? No. Can you hear the wind? Yes, yeah, you can. you can. You can hear the wind hitting things. But actually, if the wind's moving and there's nothing to resist it, you can't even hear the wind. Wind's invisible, right? Now, <laughs> if we're going to argue with atheists, you know, we shouldn't believe in gravity because we can't see it. We shouldn't believe in wind because we can't see it. But the truth of the matter is there's wind that's powerful enough to knock you over. Brother Tim was showing us wind the other night on his cell phone, blowing over a squirrel or something like that. And, uh, you know, he got some nice wind. And wind's real even though you can't see it, right? But you can see its effects. You can see the effect of the wind, but you cannot see the wind itself. And Jesus here is likening the spirit to, to the wind. That is, it cannot be seen with the eye, but the effects of it are visible still. And so he says, he that is born of the spirit, or so is everyone that is born of the spirit. The wind bloweth whether it listeth, and now uh, here's the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh or whither it goeth. Every now and again, when I'm in a, in a group like this and we're in a small room, I just want to throw open the doors. Do you ever just throw open the doors? You say, why, Pastor? Well, for fresh air. Do you realize all the air in this room is being recycled right now by all of us? You're breathing air. I've breathed. I'm breathing air. You've breathed. And it, the whole thought of it just makes me nauseous. <laughs> just, just thinking about it, the invisible things that are moving on the wind and so forth. And then when you smell things, the wind is even worse when you breathe. Nobody wants to uh, breathe wind. I woke you all up now. Welcome back. Glad you're here. Okay. So, uh, but the fact of the matter is that you can't see the wind, but it is very evident that it's there and it actually moves things and makes sounds. And so is everyone, the Bible says, that's born of the Spirit. Notice, why does a believer get under great conviction and feel that he must share the gospel with the lost? The wind of the Spirit. Why does a believer get under great conviction for sin and feel that he must get victory the way the Bible teaches that he ought to? The wind of the Spirit. In other words, the movement of the Spirit is, is not invisible. In other words, the person of the Spirit you cannot see, but he's very evidently in a place. I feel the Spirit in this room right now. The Spirit of God is in this place, in this room. The Bible says we're two or three are together, together in my name. There I am in the midst of them. This is a place that a person who is opposed to the Spirit of God would find very, very uncomfortable right now. You come to this place and you're against God or you're against His Spirit, you would feel the Spirit of God in a way that would make you very uncomfortable because God's Spirit is in this place, He's in this room. And uh, that is the wind of the Spirit. And it's real. I've been sharing the gospel with people before, and I've seen them visibly disturbed. 
And I used to just be like, what's going on with this person? Now I just speak it. I just identify. I say, you know, you're really bothered right now because you're feeling something. I'll tell you what you're feeling is God's Spirit. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. And so I can't get in your heart. I can't make you feel what you're feeling, but God is right now, isn't He? And it's incredible how true that is. And this is, what, this is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus, and this is the reality of what he's feeling. How many of you can testify that's what God did? That's what God did when you got saved. That's like you just can't explain it, but it's the wind of the Spirit. Okay? So again, simplicity of the gospel. He said, Pastor, you're supposed to be two men a message, remember? Yeah, right. Okay, verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And now here's the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. So if you have to be born of the Spirit, you'll be a person who is moved by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, the Spirit of God uh, is visible in him. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? Now here he's not saying, I don't believe that's possible. That isn't this, the way that how can these things be. He's saying, how can this be accomplished? Of course, how can a person... Okay, you tell me that a person born of the Spirit is moved by the Spirit, it's, it's like the wind, that's the illustration of it, but how do I do it? And so Jesus is going to say something that doesn't sound nice, but it is very, very revealing of not only the simplicity of the gospel, but very, very, uh, very revealing to Nicodemus to say, you're definitely not saved, man. You're definitely not saved. He said, art thou a teacher, art thou a master of Israel, verse 10, and knowest not these things? He said, how can these things be? And Jesus said, how could you not know? How could you not know? And uh, he said, if I've told you of earthly things and you believe not, I'm sorry, I, I skipped verse 11. Verily, verily, it's again, we know what that means. I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we've seen and ye receive not our witness. Jesus said, Nicodemus, how can you not know these things because we've spoken them to you. We've told you what we've seen. And, but the reason you don't know how to be born of the Spirit is you've received not our witness. There is the reception of the spiritual birth that's necessary in order for a person to be born again. Because you can know about spiritual birth, you can know about God, you can know the gospel, but without receiving it, without the reception of it, there is no spiritual birth. Again, spiritual birth, Jesus is here and emphasizing is by our choice. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Jesus said, I can't really help you if you won't believe me. You know, God can't help anybody that won't believe Him, can He? You know, that's more than true just for a lost person. That's also true for a saved person. You know how many times the plain apparent truth of God's will or God's purpose or what God wants from a believer is clearly revealed in His Word and Christians are like, well, I just don't see how that could work. Because I don't believe you, God. And God can't do much with someone who won't believe Him. I don't know how many times, though, an attitude of a believer begins with, I don't fully understand that, but I can see that it's clearly explained that this is what I'm supposed to do or what I'm, how I'm supposed to respond. And so I just believe it. And then it's incredible what God can do with that. And Jesus is here telling Nicodemus, I'm not giving you information so that you can digest it and retain it and have it at your disposal. I'm giving you information so you can believe it and so you can be born spiritually. Friend, knowledge, the, uh, Paul told the church at Corinth, puffeth up, charity edifieth. And you know, knowing the gospel is not about me knowing that I'm saved and you're lost. Knowing the gospel is about people receiving it. And that's the most important aspect of the gospel. You know, so many times we're worried about, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? And the question is, are you willing to receive whatever God says? It's a good place to begin when you're preaching the gospel with somebody. Say, you know something? If God shows you, not if I can show you, if God shows you what the truth is, will you receive it? And I've found for believers, I can't counsel someone that won't receive God's truth. I've had people come to me before, and I've given them counsel, and I realize, you know something? They were hoping that I would tell them what they wanted to hear. But what I told them was what the Word of God says, and so they're just going to go find someone else that will tell them what they want to hear. And then maybe when they have the consequences for that, they'll eventually want to know what God says because only God's way works. Nothing else works. But I've realized you don't give somebody counsel that's not going to believe it. It's not going to receive it. So I'll ask people, if I can prove from the Word of God, will you do whatever the Bible says? 
If God shows you something, will you do whatever he says? And if the answer is, well, I'm not sure about this, say, well, you know, go wrestle that question through. When you come back with the answer of yes, then we'll discuss it. But until then, I can't tell you anything at all. You just want to retain knowledge. And there are individuals that are religious, or they're interested in religion. They're almost religious connoisseurs, and they're willing to add a religion or to have knowledge of religion, but they're not seeking to be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying this is exclusive, and you, you have to do it my way. Then he lets Nicodemus know one more thing. What did, Jesus, what did Nicodemus tell Jesus first? Let's see if anybody uh, is still with us here. What was the first thing Nicodemus told Jesus? We know your teacher come from God. Okay. The miracles. All right, so we know where you came from, right? Because the miracles you do prove it, Okay. So then in verse 13, Jesus gets back to what Nicodemus said. He said, no man hath ascended unto heaven. Nicodemus knew Jesus came from where? From heaven, from God. No man hath ascended to heaven, but, the son, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And this is Jesus' polite way of saying you don't know where heaven is, and so there's no possible way you could know how to get there. Isn't it incredible how many people want to die and figure it out? Really, a lot of people, I don't know, I mean, I couldn't tell you what percentage, but it's a high percentage of people that don't want to think about their eternal life, and they're willing to just die and see if they can figure it out. I'll just go into the spirit world and see if I can navigate my way to God. Now, I know they don't say it that way, but that's what they mean. I'll just wait till I die, and I'll see what happens. Friend, we know not only is that a risky proposal, but it's a surefire way to get to the wrong place. Because we already know how to get there. It's natural for us to be sinners. And it's natural for us to be hellbound. And so you won't accidentally wander into heaven. You won't have, you know what, turns out I was a pretty good person and my good works outweigh my bad works. And so my sin means nothing to God. He's decided not to judge me like he judges everyone else. And so I get to be in his presence. No, God's holy, my friend, and he's in a place that is far-reaching. God's holiness separates us from him by distance and also by character. And so Jesus told Nicodemus, you don't know where heaven is and you sure don't know how to get there. But evidently I came from there, didn't I? And that's where he draws the conclusion that I'm the one that has to get you there. Uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you struggle with your memory like I do, you can jot in the margins of your Bible next to verse 14, Numbers 21, 9, which is where we see the story of the children of Israel in the wandering in the wilderness and where they are complaining against God and complaining against Moses. And they said, you remember my, one of my favorite statements in the Bible, there's no bread. And as for the, and my, my, our soul loatheth this light bread. They said, there's no bread and we don't like the bread. And it's to me one of the most ironic, humorous statements in the Bible complain about God's provision and ingratitude and God sent serpents to bite them and the fiery serpents when they bit them they died and so after a while of people dying they thought well that was really a bad idea blasting God blasting Moses and so we wish we hadn't done that and they were repentant and they came to God and said God you know or Moses they came to Moses I should say and said you know tell God we're sorry and God told Moses to lift up a serpent in the wilderness put a brass serpent on a stick and you it's a medical sign of healing. You see it at the doctor's office, the, the serpent on the stick. Uh, I call it a snake on a stick, but it's, you see Medusa. it on an ambulance. or What? Is it the Medusa? Medical Medusa? That's, it's been hijacked as that, but it's the snake on a stick. It's a sign of healing. And so um, anybody that looked at the serpent lived, and anyone that didn't look at it died. And Jesus said, that's what faith is. Now, when I was a kid, I went on a lot of family vacations, and uh, surprisingly, we actually made it to our destination most of the time. Sometimes we go out to Colorado and we go camping in the mountains and the Rockies. And sometimes I remember we did a family vacation where we drove up the East Coast and we went through Philadelphia, Washington D.C., and uh, New York City, and up to the Niagara Falls, and saw a lot of those things. Been a lot of those places, but I remember as a kid, riding in the car knowing where we were going, but not having a clue how to get there. Now, how did I get there? Be there yet. <laughs> not in our house. <laughs> not, not my parents. 
Now, some parents wouldn't kill you for that, but there were there were capital crimes. I don't know how many siblings that I didn't know about that came before me, but I'm sure some died before I was born that said the wrong things. I didn't say those things. But uh, are we there? Yeah. Okay, so how did I get to those destinations as a child that couldn't read a map? Now, my dad knew how to get there, right? And it was painful going places with my dad, but he could get you there. You know our teens go every summer to camp in Tennessee. They don't have a clue how to get there. They just don't. They just have to be here before they see taillights on the bus. And if they make it on the bus, they'll get to camp. Who has to know how to get there? I do. Okay, no one on earth has ever been to heaven except for Jesus. And to get to heaven, you don't have to know how to get there. You have to know someone that does. And Jesus gets you there. You see, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you don't know where heaven is, and you sure don't know how to get there. But he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And just like in the wilderness, it was as simple as looking at the snake on the stick, and you lived. Believing in Jesus and being born spiritually, experiencing spiritual birth, is as easy as looking at Jesus on the cross. It's not a work. It's a decision. I'm gonna, Jesus, I don't know how to get to heaven. Jesus, I'm not worthy to get to heaven, but you are, and I'm trusting you to get me there. That translates this way. God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. You say, Pastor, shouldn't you say, God, I know I'm a sinner? Go ahead. If you want Jesus to be your Savior, you know you're a sinner, don't you? Shouldn't you say, God, I repent of my sins? Fine, go ahead. You don't look to Jesus and look to your sin. In other words, it's just as simple as saying, Jesus, I need you. Why did Jesus get lifted up on the cross? Why did Jesus die? For atonement for sin. He died in our place. He died for our sin. Everything about looking to Jesus is very, very simple, but it explains everything that you're looking to when you do it. I wouldn't look to Jesus if I didn't need a Savior. Right? And so, how is it that a person can receive the gift of eternal life? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's that simple. Believe in Jesus. So what's the gospel? Well, Patty said it just a little bit ago. You know, it's the death, death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It's explained that way by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. But what's the gospel? Jesus died for our sin, and in order to be born spiritually, you have to look for Jesus to do what you can't do for yourself. Man, that's easy, isn't it? Man, that's simple, isn't it? And that's the process of spiritual birth. In other words, I don't do it for myself, but I look to Jesus, and Jesus does it for me. And you just can't explain it any better than that. It covers all the bases covers all the things that you need. It's just important for us to realize what Nicodemus realized. Only Jesus can get me to heaven. Only Jesus has been there, and only Jesus has the answer. You know the beauty of it all? I believe Nicodemus is there. I believe Nicodemus is there. We have this encounter with him. The next time we see Nicodemus, he's challenging a council which is trying to condemn Jesus. Last time we, we hear from Nicodemus, he's responding to uh, trying to re trying to get his body for burial. Nicodemus is a saved man. You know how he got saved? He met Jesus. He met Jesus. He looked to Jesus. I don't know this to be true, but you know I make up things in my mind, and this is one I've made up. The disciples, except for John, forsook Jesus and fled. I think Nicodemus was somewhere around there. Looking at Jesus lifted up. And believing him so that he wouldn't perish and have eternal life. Have you looked to Jesus? We have a song that I'd like to conclude our service with. If I can find the page number, it's Look and Live. Look and Live. Look and live. I think it's in... I hope it's in our hymn book. So a message from the Lord, hallelujah. Message unto you I'll give. It's recorded in his word, hallelujah. 
195. If only we'll look and live. Andrew, would you come lead us in that and then dismiss us in prayer? <clears throat> Hymn number 195 will be our invitation hymn. 195, Look and Live. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs> opportunity to be in your house. I do pray for safety for everybody that's traveling, that they travel back home or travel down to Miami Beach, that you would bless the services there, and help us to be back tonight to hear from your word again. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 